Oh, sorry, I'm just working. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is William Blair. I'm a PhD candidate at Boston University, studying under the supervision of Manuel Egla. Like Matias said, I'd like to talk about hot fuzz, how you can discover algorithmic uh, algorithmic denial of service vulnerabilities through guided microfuzzing. But first, let's go back to the fall of 1988, when a researcher named Barton Miller is working remotely one night, and a rainy weather starts corrupting the data being sent over his dial-up connection, and starts generating random data on the TTY uh, programs that he's working with. Now, there's nothing surprising about some bad weather starting to corrupt a, a really bad dial-up connection. But what is surprising is that the random data being fed to the programs on the other end starts to cause these programs to crash. And a systematic investigation from this observation reveals the fact that at the time, if you just feed random data into the Unix utilities, you can successfully crash 33% of them on a Unix system. Since then, fuzz testing has evolved into a sophisticated form of offline analysis that runs in parallel to the software development life cycle, where a fuzzer takes a given program under test, tries to automatically execute it until it can either crash the until it can crash the program and produce those test cases that uh, crash it as potent as evidence of memory corruption bugs in the original program. Now a programmer and analyst can take this and uh, diagnose, uh, help diagnose the underlying memory cor corruption bug in the program, but an uh, orthogonal bug it, beyond memory corruption vulnerabilities are algorithmic complexity bugs, where specific inputs can start to affect the performance of an individual program as opposed to just crashing it. And as a concrete example, let's imagine the familiar case we all have where we're shopping online and suppose I want to treat myself to a very expensive brand new Porsche. But at the same time, I also forgot that I need paper towels. Now, my claim is, when I go to check out my transaction, the bit of code that adds these two things together, which have very different values, can cause the uh, computation to run for over four and a half months. Now, this isn't just conjecture. This is something we observed on real production code. And at the end of this presentation, I hope to conv I want to, you'll be able to know the root cause of this vulnerability and also show how uh, our technique of microfuzzing can help uh, not only identify this issue, but other issues hiding inside uh, programs. But let's dive into the implementation details or a high level overview of hot fuzz, our microfuzzing framework that takes in unmodified production jar files, the same of which you uh, are running on most of your computers here today, I'm sure, and uh, are and are fed into our distributed microfuzzing framework. Now, the way this works is we take all of the methods contained inside these jar files and we submit them into an, uh, a message broker running inside our distributed framework. Sometimes the message broker takes a while. Um, and the message broker dispatches each of these methods onto a distributed set of microfuzzing instances all running within a Kubernetes uh, framework. Now, what's happening here, now, uh, and generally, when you apply a fuzz testing uh, tool, you're working with a whole program, right, that reads input from standard, reads from standard in. But in this case, each microfuzzing instance is working with a specific method under test that takes arbit uh, that may take types of or instances of arbitrary type as input. For that reason, uh, microfuzz needs to synthesize or automatically create the test harness that can automatically invoke the given method and then sanitize its execution for an algorithmic complexity vulnerability. To do so, it utilizes the IVM, or our fork of the Java virtual machine that provides fine-grained measurements of runtime with cycle-level granularity in order to give uh, each microfuzz instance visibility into what inputs cause the most resource consumption for the given method under test. Now this process can run until, uh, say, a given timeout occurs, and we're going to generate some observations uh, during this uh, uh, entire fuzzing pipeline and store them inside um, an external database. Now, if I run this, oh, and while we're running this process, we need to be very careful to limit the amount of non-determinism that is introduced in, in, into the first stage of distributed microfuzzing. For example, uh, the first thing we do when we run a method under test is run the IVM in interpreted mode so that the effects of JIT compilation do not introduce noise into our result or affect, let's say, the uh, search for an algorithmic complexity vulnerability. And second, we pin the execution of every single method under test to its own CPU using the standard uh, shed uh, get affinity and set affinity API available on Linux. And those uh, inputs for which the, that are marked as potentially vulnerable for an algorithmic complexity vulnerability are saved into an external database. 
So at this point, I have some amount of candidate bugs that I've seen in an interpreted an analysis environment as being potentially vulnerable to an algorithmic complexity vulnerability. You know, as a, a programmer, I may think there's quite a few false positives in these results. And for that reason, I take those test cases that are algorithmic complexity vulnerability that are evidence of AC bugs, synthesize Java programs that uh, execute the method on the same input, monitor their execution to see if when I run them in a uh, open JDK environment with JIT enabled, if I can see that they, one, use a substantial amount of CPU resources, and two, uh, exceed a configured timeout for my specific library under test, that jar file given on the left. If they do, I produce those test cases as output um, that I present to an analyst or a programmer that can help them debug potential performance problems inside their code, which an adversary may be able to take as proof of concept exploits to achieve denial of service on the given uh, library or any programs that may use this library as a dependency. Now, now that we've kind of introduced the whole pipeline of hot fuzz, let's talk about the details that go into implementing micro fuzzing. So uh, each uh, hot fuzz instance takes this method under test, which may be a method of, uh, contained in any arbitrary class, right, in, in Java, and may take instances of arbitrary type. The first thing that it needs to do is automatically generate a test harness for this individual method. Now, a test harness normally, uh, if I was using libfuzzer, would be a bit of code that translates a flat bitmap into the types needed to invoke a given method. But here, uh, the test harness for a given Java method is simply the, all of the Java variables required to successfully invoke that method. And what HotFuzz does is it generates those values at random, and then it successfully, ideally, is able to execute the given method. Now that we are able to execute a given method, we need to sanitize its execution for algorithmic complexity vulnerabilities. And the way we implement sanitization in HotFuzz is using two approaches. The first thing we start off with is a configured threshold T, and we use the uh, fine-grained measurements available in the IVM to inspect the runtime for every single execution for a given method. Now if the execution is less than some value T, we don't care, and we could let microfuzzing continue as normal. However, if the runtime exceeds some threshold T, that's why we want to sanitize the execution and kill the process and submit the test case as evidence of a potential AC bug. And there's two things going on during the sanitization. The runtime is provided by our altered JVM, whereas the actual signal or that an AC bug is present is we just use the uh, timer API available on Unix systems, where at the beginning of every method invocation, we start a timer for 10 seconds, and if the method fails to clear the timer, the uh, operating system kills the process and we submit a test case uh, for the synthesis and validation stage. So now we have this way to automatically generate, uh, invoke methods and sanitize their execution for AC bugs. Let's look at the actual uh, pipeline for microfuzzing using a genetic algorithm for the method under test. And in this case, our genetic algorithm consists of initial population of Java objects that over a period of generations are transformed using the standard operators of every genetic algorithm we'll use, crossover and mutation. Crossover produces new offspring in each, op in each uh, generation and ensures diversity in the overall population, whereas mutation introduces uh, uh, small changes to some small set of the population in each generation. And in general, these two operators, crossover and mutation, apply generally to sequential data or flat bitmaps in uh, most fuzzers. In our setting here, where the population consists of instances of objects of arbitrary type, applying those techniques of uh, crossover mutation over uh, flat bitmaps will not work because if you uh, apply them, let's say, to a Java object in memory, it will quickly corrupt the uh, strict binary format required for Java objects and cause the JVM to crash. For this reason, let's represent Java objects as tree data structures. And in here, I'll just give you a quick example of how you can cross over two simple objects, where the root of this tree data structure is the object itself, and any node that descends from the root is either a, another Java object or a primitive type, which you could modify using the standard crossover and mutation operators. So given the, if I want to cross over these two objects, I need to cross over their left children, or the left child, and the right child. So this is two pairs of objects that we cross over, the left children uh, go to the left uh, result of the crossover, and the right children go to the right uh, uh, object of the crossover. So now that we can cross over, and in, in this case here, this is just 
over objects of primitive that contain, uh, let's say, fields of primitive types. But if they were slightly more complex structure, uh, you would just apply this algorithm recursively um, as the tree becomes deeper. Likewise, with mutation, um, if I have a, give a simple object here, I just perform a random walk down that tree until I encounter a primitive type, at which I apply the standard uh, operation for mutations, such as bit flipping, to obtain a new Java object. So with this genetic algorithm in place uh, to perform microfuzzing, we now need a way to start with seed, uh, generate our seed inputs to form our initial population. And here we can just start off with our method under test, we, uh, and we start inspecting the type using the reflection API available in Java to in, uh, instantiate each uh, object that we need to invoke the method. And this, in this case, we just walk up all the uh, types needed uh, to invoke each constructor until we hit a primitive type, at which point we can go down two one of two paths. Either we use identity value instantiation, which is our baseline technique, which was inspired by the evaluating fuzz testing paper from CCS 18. And in this case, this provides an absolute baseline, right, and, and uses the uh, smallest value for each uh, primitive type needed. And here we use zero as an int, but if this were a string or a bool, it would be an empty string and false. And we use this to evaluate the effectiveness of our proposed strategy that we call small recursive instantiation. And the intuition here is that if we need a primitive type, let's just sample from a distribution, in this case, the normal distribution centered at zero, with a standard deviation that's bounded by some configured parameter alpha. The intuition is here is if I just sampled from, let's say, the domain of all ints, I may waste fuzzing time uh, by, say, on, uh, wasting time on benign methods, say, allocating arrays of enormous size. In an earlier prototype, this is something that we observed, and by starting off from this kind of more restricted distribution, we aim to make microfuzzing a more uh, efficient process. So with these two uh, seed input strategies in place, we now are going to get in our output some test cases that we need to synthesize into real programs. And observe that the tree structure that I showed in the previous slide enables us to obtain this new Java program by just doing an in-order depth-first uh, traversal of that tree structure and then dropping those values into, say, a bit of Java code that you can compile and execute uh, during synthesis and validation. All right. With that uh, kind of overview of the implementation that we have, we had two goals for evaluating our technique. The first one was that, is microfuzzing, as we've described it, effective at detecting real AC bugs? And second, is our seed input uh, instantiation strategy uh, improve upon the baseline IVI? So for the articles that we considered in our evaluation, Every method contained inside the Java runtime environment, which is the library used by every single pro uh, Java program uh, in existence, the uh, challenges contained in the DARPA stack program, and the 100 most popular libraries on Maven, we observed that based on the number uh, the bugs detected, SRI outperformed IVI for each artifact in our evaluation, and microfuzzing in general was able to execute successfully execute tens of thousands of Java methods without requiring any manual intervention for constructing the test harness. So with those uh, results in hand, I can now go in depth to the original vulnerability that I started this talk off. And if you take a look at this program here, all we're doing is creating two uh, big decimal objects, which is the uh, JRE's abstraction for computing arbitrary precision floating point numbers, and I'm adding them together. And what's really interesting is if an adversary can influence the value of either S or T, they can achieve a denial of service pro, uh, attack on any program that implements this kind of pattern. Now, in this case here, this is just adding two numbers together. But if, say, in a higher level library like JSON, you're able to represent something like this and then add one to a large value, you could uh, DOS the program that's using it, which is a really interesting result. And in here, you can see the proof of concept, uh, uh, proof of concept that actually implements this attack where you add together a number represented in scientific notation where the exponent is the largest possible exponent that you can use, in this case, two to the power of 31. And you add that number to simply one. What's interesting is that in the implementation of big decimal add, what it will do is uh, try to compute a big integer representation of the number on the left, and then try to add that to the number on the right. What we observed is that the, uh, for every implementation of the JVM, if you try to run this POC, the runtime of computing that number as an integer representation takes over an hour on every implementation of the JVM. And when we reported our findings, we received varying uh, responses. 
IBM, uh, for the IBM J9, our P proof of concept runs for over four and a half months on a standard Linux machine, and they were kind enough to issue us a CVE for our findings. On Oracle, the POC can run for an hour before it terminates with an exception, and they issued us a security, uh, credited us in a security in-depth issue. Finally, the Google POC, when you run inside an Android emulated environment, runs for 24 hours. However, Google was not concerned about this and claimed it was not a, a vector for denial of service. So what have we talked about today? I've introduced microfuzzing as a technique for automatically executing uh, code, let's say, in high-level languages and sanitizing its execution for algorithmic complexity vulnerabilities. We described our prototype implementation of hot fuzz of this, hot fuzz or prototype implementation of this technique. And we've uh, outlined two strategies for generating seed inputs for microfuzzing that, uh, and demonstrated that our proposed strategy, SRI, outperforms the baseline strategy, IVI, which intuitively starts fuzzing with no information. In our evaluation, uh, today I only talked about the big decimal, but for all of the artifacts that we considered, uh, including the JRE and the Maven articles, we found 150 AC bugs in uh, those artifacts, as well as detecting both known and unintended uh, vulnerabilities in the DARPA stack challenges. And then finally, we just showed how uh, an AC bug in production can trigger denial of service in unsuspecting uh, victim programs. And with that, I'd be happy to receive any uh, questions you may have. Thank you. Very nice work. Do you want to share where you're buying your cars and your paper? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a, a contrived web app. <laughs> Questions? Uh, Said from CEO Boulder. Um, I want to see if you have some idea about the singularity. It is in FSC 18, I guess, and they did similar things as you did for mutation. Uh, I, I think we cited the singularity paper. Um, I, I do not, I, I, off the top of my head, I'm not familiar with how we mutated Java objects is similar to that, but I do remember that that is in our related work. I'm sorry. I do have a question regarding the object instantiation. You said you just woke up backwards uh, until you reach uh, root nodes. How do you just select which constructor, constructor you call? Because this can depend on, on different, many different things. And you, you hand wavily say, oh, I'll just use the simplest one, right? But oh. there, there's a very complex strategy you could think of. So the strategy that's in place, at least in this implementation, is that for a given class, you just uh, obtain the list of all constructor or public constructors that are available. You select one uniformly at random, and okay. you try that until it works. Right. So you just do backward recursive random. Yep. Cool. Yeah, that makes much more sense. Um, other questions? So one of the things that wasn't really clear um, to me here was the, the necessity of the test harnesses and when you moved from the simple examples to the test harnesses. You already observed this in your, in your emulator. Um, what's, what are the necessary steps from moving from one to the other and what are the, uh, the potential pitfalls there? Is there any loss of precision there? Why do you really need this? And do you want to give us some more details on that? Uh, is the question, why do we need to divide this into two stages? Yeah. yeah. The, um, I think you, you do need it because the, the, inter the environment in which these things are, are, the environment in which fuzzing runs is, uh, let's say, altered, right? Because it runs in an altered JVM environment, and it's running in interpretive mode. So I, I think you could possibly ac accomplish those two stages in one environment. It's just that uh, you would want to save the test cases uh, in a proper form so that you could generate them later and then monitor their execution in, in some environment. Right. It'd, it'd be cool if you could merge them together such that uh, you could fuzz with JIT enabled and guarantee that JIT does not affect the measurement. That would be a really, a really cool setup. But this would just require a little bit more work on your, your behalf, right? It, more engineering and understanding the JIT compiler more. Yeah. But student time is almost free, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I wondered regarding the the ten second timeout. You mentioned uh, that you have the ten second timeout. Yep. Is this a hard coded, settled, and written in stone heuristic, or is this configurable according to the um, the the corpus that you are targeting? Because it's to, to give you some context, um, the for regular coverage-guided fuzzing, setting the timeout when you detect a hang is very, very crucial. 
And oftentimes, depending on, on if you change instrumentation, you have a whole, whole bunch of examples that just drop beyond this, uh, this timeout. And 10 seconds seems somewhat arbitrary. Right, so the, I wondered if you measured, if you find a lot of things that just fall in between, or do you use the, the, the timeout as actual indication and feedback to, to adjust your system for different kinds of, uh, of complexity bugs, or is it just a hard timeout and like, you haven't looked further than that? At the moment, it's a, a hard timeout, but it is configurable. It would be interesting to see as you like, change the timeout for yeah, a given, right. let's say, evaluation artifact, how that changes. But in this case, we just want to... And not just changing the, the timeout, but actually keeping track of all the executions, right? If you do slight variations, I, I suddenly see a spike. Oh, right? Instead of having a binary flag, it's above or below this timeout, you could have something that, that scales. Oh, I'm getting uh, N percent increase compared to the, to the previous change. So this may be something that I should continue developing further. Oh, sorry. You mean if we, let's say, do one stage with 10 seconds observe and feed that to the next stage yeah. that changes? Oh, yeah, that's not implemented right now, but that'd be really, I think that'd be a cool thing. Right, and not 10 seconds, but make it variable, right? So observe yeah. the, the changes in time. In incorporate feedback into the choice of timeout yeah. after, okay. Yeah. Right. Think coverage guided fuzzing, but for, for timing information. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? Or else I'll just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is fine. Thank you for the presentation. This was fun. Thank you.